a good morning or afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jan Reichert, Executive Director of the Antibody Society. Today's webinar is one in a series designed to inform and educate our members, as well as the broader scientific community, about topics relating to the adaptive immune receptor repertoire. The Antibody Society is pleased to include a group that works actively in this area. They comprise the Adaptive Immune Receptor Repertoire Community, also called the AIR Community. Our speakers today, Mylena Pavlovich and Maria Chernigovskaya, are affiliated with the University of Oslo, as well as the AIR Community. Today, they will tell us about machine learning for the analysis of adaptive immune receptors and repertoires. Please note, the webinar is being recorded. Please do add any and all questions to the Q&A box in the viewer, and those questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, I'll now turn the show over to our first speaker. Hi, thank you so much for having us today. I'd like to start with a quote of a Ray Bradbury, but a bit modified. So, is the machine learning for the analysis of adaptive immune receptors and repertoires is just trying to find these things to see if they work or maybe not. So today we will discuss different types of AR data and different machine learning algorithms that can be applied to this data. And also we will discuss the challenges and the best practices for machine learning in the adaptive immune receptor and repertoire data. As I said before, we will talk both about the receptors and repertoires. So immune receptors or ARs or BCRs, TCRs, they are one of the key agents of adaptive immune systems and they can recognize uh, different antigens. And one of the most important region for the antigen recognition is called the CDR3 region, the most variable region. And um, adaptive immune repertoire is a set of different uh, immune receptors within one individual. And uh, it records all the past and present immune events that happening for an individual, for example, diseases, vaccinations, uh, and other things. As we know, the both BCRs and TCRs, they are constructed during the VDJ recombination process, where one V, D, and J gene is picked randomly to combine one chain of the receptor. And as we know, BCRs and TCRs, they are constructed of two chains. Uh, there are different types of AR data that we can use for the analysis. So on the receptor level, we can have uh, receptor sequences. They can be nucleotide, amino acid sequences, full lengths, or just a CDR3 region with the name of the V gene and the name of the J gene. It can also be the three-dimensional three structure of this receptor, or we can also know the binding of this specific uh, receptor to a peptide. Most of the time, we know the sequence information for the receptor because the structural and binding information is much more harder to get. On the repertoire level, use AR sequences pipelines. They can be bulk or single cell sequencing with or without UMIs. And sometimes we have paired data where for one chain, we know the other chain, which is coupled in one receptor or sometimes we just have a set of uh, uh, set of unique uh, heavy light alpha beta receptors. There are many more interesting types of uh, repertoire data that we can also use in the analysis. For example, we can couple paired air seq data with the gene expression information or with uh, specificity to a set of predefined uh, antigens. For example, LibreSeq analysis. But what are the main immunological questions that we want to address using those types of data? First of all, we want to improve our diagnostics using immune repertoires, for example. So if we have an individual and we know the repertoire of this individual, we want to know what are the diseases that this person has currently or had before. And on the receptor level, ideally, we want to improve our vaccines, monoclonal antibodies, 
and other therapeutics design because we know that it takes a lot of time to have to develop a good drug and potentially those data and those type of analysis can help us a lot and there are many computational approaches that work with air data on the receptor level on the repertoire level some of them are more simple some of them are a bit more complex so we can estimate the diversity of the repertoire uh, the architecture or we can just uh, uh, predict the motif within the receptor but all these computational approaches they face the same problems uh, the same complexity of the air data so first of all we know that the potential diversity of an immune repertoire is extremely large but when we have our sequences data, sequencing data it can only cover a tiny part of our potential diversity also we know that the overlap between different individuals between the repertoires of different individuals is less than one percent and on the receptor level we know that uh, one uh, one receptor can bind to several antigens and vice versa and also similar receptors doesn't mean that they will bind to similar antigens which complicates the binding prediction so theoretically all these problems can be addressed using machine learning because we know that machine learning works well when we when we want to analyze complex high dimensional data and detect some hidden patterns in those data now milena will talk about the machine learning a bit So we have a tiny technical problem. Yeah, let's just switch. Um, okay, so so uh, when talking uh, machine learning, we say this is uh, uh, yes. I hope you can uh, hear me now. So uh, when talking about uh, machine learning, we first want to define what, uh, what it is, what do we mean by this? Um, so we can uh, broadly define machine learning as a set of uh, pattern recognition and function approximation uh, techniques that find some sort of patterns in uh, groups of typically large uh, amounts of, uh, of data. And we can also look at them as a set of different methods that allow us to make uh, inferences uh, about our, uh, our data. So, for example, uh, we could try to uh, predict the, if the sequence will bind to a given antigen. Um, and we can uh, regard machine learning in this uh, setting as a function approximation task. So we want to approximate the function that, will, that determines the binding from the sequence uh, to the uh, our target uh, target label. In this setting, we have uh, uh, sequences that are also called examples in machine learning terminology, and uh, the function that uh, we're interested in estimating and the target labels. Um, in uh, this case, uh, sequences as such are typically not an input to um, to a machine learning uh, algorithm. So what we need to do is to represent uh, our sequences and or our, our data more generally in some format that could be used uh, for, um, uh, for machine learning. some sort of numerical representation that carries the information that uh, is relevant for, uh, for our problem. So this representation or encoding could be manually set, like choosing uh, different uh, physical chemical features or some other type of uh, information or it can be estimated uh, from the data uh, and also when we have the function that uh, this uh, the function that we want to estimate that performs our target task we also have uh, some parameters of that function and they are typically learned uh, during uh, during training uh, 
so one thing that's really important about machine learning is that it actually discovers statistical associations in the data. So these associations that exist in, in our features uh, between that and our target uh, labels are what enables uh, good prediction. Um, and uh, of course, our aim is to get a good predictive model, also to get uh, some sort of biological insight into how this, uh, how this function works. And uh, this is why we also want our models not just to perform well, but to be uh, interpretable. And uh, it's important to note that uh, what we learn here are not causal relations, so not really biological mechanisms, but they could be, this information can be a starting point for, for further analysis. Um, and there are a lot of, uh, of studies uh, that uh, employ machine learning uh, for uh, different uh, types of uh, analysis in, in the air data. Uh, and only, of course, a very small subset of them are shown here. So the, the next part that uh, we want to discuss today is like, where exactly do we apply uh, machine learning in the air? And this is, of course, uh, an exhaustive list uh, of neither application areas nor the papers, uh, but it's more aimed to provide an uh, overview of what uh, and some examples of uh, what is happening in this field. So uh, one example uh, application area is uh, predicting receptor specificity, uh, the same as uh, I showed before when defining machine learning. So uh, one uh, to to examining this receptor specificity is to look into sequence similarity of uh, particular receptors. So we can try to see uh, which sequences are similar to the sequences of known uh, binding and use that information to uh, predict uh, the binding for uh, new sequences. And there are many methods that are based uh, on, on this information. Uh, for example, there was a TCR DIST uh, method in uh, 2017 and uh, there's a new version uh, published recently where they look uh, into how uh, sequences differ um, and in which parts of the sequence they differ in order to uh, compute the distance metrics uh, between the, the distance between the receptors and then uh, classify the sequences according to their binding. Uh, a similar uh, thought is kind of also behind the glyph uh, paper uh, again from 2017 when they look into sequence similarity and try to find some sort of motifs there. Uh, there is also this uh, iSmart approach and uh, uh, many, uh, many others uh, in, in thinking a bit in line of the sequence similarity. But uh, there are a lot of different sequences and uh, some of them share uh, similarity, uh, uh, share uh, the binding uh, specificity. So it could not be all that, uh, the sequence information alone uh, is information is necessary. Maybe if we look at uh, the actual binding uh, in the contact sites uh, of the between the the receptor and the antigen it binds to maybe it is actually a short stretches, short subsequences that are relevant and that are uh, our kind of data representation for, for machine learning. One uh, such approach was uh, this uh, paper by uh, Osmeyer and colleagues where they try to uh, predict uh, cancer uh, status, where they look into uh, four sequences uh, from uh, T-cell receptors. Uh, alternatively, uh, there are methods that uh, look into physicochemical properties of these receptors, and sometimes those are also based on property of uh, uh, subsequence properties, uh, properties of subsequence of, the, of these uh, types of receptors. So there is also, uh, for example, a TCR match that looks into uh, KMER similarity and then averages the KMER similarity across different. Uh, KMER lengths in order to match the sequences against the sequences with the known specificity. 
uh, there is also other approaches that look into camera frequencies in order to predict uh, uh, this uh, type of uh, this type of information. Uh, however, we can uh, hypothesize that this might not be enough. Are the camers all there is? Uh, it could be that it's uh, not. So, in order to predict uh, receptor specificity, some uh, other approaches look into modeling the antibody antigen interactions and they try to model the relations uh, between different uh, antibodies and the uh, different antigens and then try to kind of uh, project that into a unique uh, or to, to come up with a unique representation that could be later used uh, for uh, predicting uh, receptor specificity. There are also other approaches that uh, look into how we can enhance the receptor specificity prediction, not just by using sequence information, but uh, enriching this information with uh, structural information as well. Uh, so, for example, this uh, deep air approach, uh, it includes uh, the way to represent uh, gene information, sequence information, but also structural information, as it was uh, predicted by uh, AlphaBall2. Um, and uh, there is uh, also other approaches that look into uh, predicting uh, structure and then based on this uh, structure, uh, try to uh, do, for example, virtual screening of antibodies against uh, a target antigen. Um, finally, this is uh, some very specific and concrete things that uh, we look into. And uh, these are all uh, manually set features based on what we believe uh, is uh, relevant for, for the sequences. Uh, but alternative is actually learn um, latent representation or uh, alternative to learn an alternative representation using sequence and maybe include uh, gene expression data um, as well as it was done in uh, MVTCR um, that was recently uh, posted as a preprint. Um, that is uh, one option. Um, other approaches also look into what kind of information is uh, necessary in order to be able to um, provide, uh, to, to learn this uh, type of uh, latent representation that could be used either to predict uh, receptor specificity, uh, to track uh, the changes in the, in the repertoire, um, or to uh, cluster sequences uh, do maybe batch correction uh, based on these uh, latent representations. Um, finally, in order to predict uh, the, the binding, it might be easier to not look into the, uh, not look into only the sequence information, but instead use the, the structural information. But the structural information is predicting the structure of antibodies is not an easy task. Um, so what uh, some uh, uh, some research uh, groups are doing is trying to predict uh, the structure of uh, of antibodies and then use that information to predict the structure in order to uh, discover uh, epitope or antigen uh, specificity. Uh, so there are uh, some uh, different uh, approaches uh, to doing this. Uh, some are based on uh, graph neural networks. Uh, some are based on uh, other uh, types of like convolutional networks. Uh, some are based on language models. Um, and uh, some try to combine um, information from multiple different models and also then because of, by doing that, they are able to estimate uh, the error rates uh, that uh, is like where the, the different models uh, disagree about the, the position. Um, that information can also be provided to kind of estimate the uncertainty of the prediction made by uh, the machine learning model. Um, and as mentioned before, some of these uh, previous models are based on uh, 
on language models uh, in order for predicting the uh, the, uh, the structure of uh, receptors. And it's easy to just say this is something that uh, works well for uh, in machine learning in general, for language, for natural language modeling. So this is something that we want to apply also in uh, uh, air setting. Um, but uh, what is important is to also kind of look into and formalize a sort of antibody uh, language. Um, why do we want to do something like that is uh, because we want to be able not to just model the structure or perform our task but uh, we also want to be able to get some sort of biological insight into the data uh, into this uh, the, the structure of sequences into the binding and so on uh, so in order to do that uh, we could maybe benefit even more from language models by formalizing this uh, antibody language uh, with uh, clear the uh, clear correspondence between the natural language task and uh, properties uh, in the for example antibody sequences that would allow us to uh, construct uh, to to learn what the model has learned to to be able to interpret it and uh, hopefully uh, be able to uh, design uh, the uh, the therapeutics based on, on the obtained information. There are also some generative models that are based uh, uh, for adaptive uh, immune receptors. Um, some of them uh, model the VDJ recombination process, uh, whereas some try to model antigen-specific uh, antibodies directly, for example. Uh, there And uh, in general, this modeling of uh, uh, modeling of different antibodies is something that we would typically want to do uh, in order to uh, enable uh, design and streamline antibody design. And uh, what we want typically look into there is uh, epitope uh, specificity. So we want antibodies so that they are specific to the target of uh, interest uh, to provide a desired affinity, but also to look into the different parameters that. Uh, Describe the developability uh, parameters. So, how possible and how easy it is to actually generate uh, these antibodies in uh, in experimental settings. There are many public repositories that uh, provide uh, repertoire sequence data, both the structural and and the sequencing data itself, uh, and also some. Uh, it is possible to generate synthetic data in order to look into uh, how these models work and uh, to hopefully uh, streamline this uh, this part. Um, there is uh, another task that uh, we might be interested in is uh, predicting uh, the antigen presentation uh, on uh, MHC complexes. Um, so uh, we want to predict the uh, peptide MHC binding, and we want also to predict the uh, binding of uh, TCR to uh, the peptide MHC complex. And there are many uh, approaches uh, based on uh, deep learning uh, for this uh, task. Uh, for example, as, as was recently uh, reviewed by Nielsen and colleagues, uh, we might want to, to have different uh, sequence information, some information that is uh, uh, coming from the side, some uh, information that is coming from the uh, MHC uh, side, and then want to be able to combine this information to predict if the binding will uh, occur or not. Uh, finally, uh, the, uh, we might want to uh, diagnose uh, immune-related diseases using uh, recept uh, receptor repertoires. So instead of uh, looking into one, we want to look at a collection of receptors in one individual and be able to diagnose different immune-related diseases. Um, repertoire classification as such is uh, something called multiple instance learning problem as defined in, uh, in machine learning. Uh, and in this case, we have uh, a set of instances, a set of sequences, only some of which are specific for our disease. And the presence of these specific instances and maybe some other uh, information determine the, the uh, whether the repertoire 
uh, reflects uh, if a person has a, a certain disease or not. And from uh, the machine learning side, uh, there was this uh, nice review by Carbono at and colleagues uh, that uh, describes uh, multiple instance learning in a more uh, formal setting. Um, but there are also a lot of uh, approaches for diagnostics that are mostly based on trying to explore this uh, sequence, uh, this uh, structure that exists in the repertoire, this multiple instance structure, um, that try to, to use that to be able to better uh, predict uh, diseases. And uh, as such, uh, they typically perform much better than uh, the, the methods that do not take the repertoire structure into account. So, uh, different machine learning methods um, have the, both have different underlying assumptions. Some of these assumptions are uh, biological assumptions, what kind of information we need. Some are uh, more subtle, more implicit, in that if we look at the k-mers of different length, what does that mean for our model? What our model can learn and discover and what it cannot do? So that is uh, something that uh, should be uh, a conscious choice by the method developer and should try to reflect the, the problem domain as much as possible. So this is something that uh, we want to, to be able to do, to have a me uh, machine learning methods that reflect uh, what uh, the, the problem of interest and that are able to uh, predict uh, well on the data that we have. And with that, I'm returning the <laughs> headphones to Maria. So what should we do if we want to develop a machine learning method that work well to unseen receptors and repertoires? So here I show a very naive way to perform uh, machine learning analysis for AR data. We can take an experimental data set that apply several machine learning approaches, estimate the accuracy of every method, and then just pick the one that works the best for this specific data set. But there are some potential problems, problems to this type of analysis. First of all, the experimental data has its own specifics when we are talking about the method development. Uh, as we know, the data size the data set size for experimental data might be not that large and for machine learning we want to have as much data as possible and also we don't really know if the sample that we are working with is is it actually representative and uh, then we cannot easily slightly change the experimental data to see how the method will work with slightly changed data set it's called uh, sensitivity estimation and also we don't have the ground truth information for experimental data and we cannot easily say what the model actually learned from the data and can we generalize it to a new unseen data set. When I say this generalizability problem, I mean something like this. Imagine you have a data set, maybe experimental data set, and you know that your machine learning method works perfectly well with your uh, data set, but what if you try to apply the same method to a new set of receptors or a new individual, for example, for some clinical um, uh, properties, for clinical things. Uh, one potential uh, way to avoid these problems or accurately estimate the uh, performance of our model on a different data set can be nested cross-validation. So nested cross-validation helps us to estimate the quality of our machine learning approach using the splitting of the data set into training, validation, and test. So we optimize our machine learning model on the training and validation set, and then we uh, we calculate the performance, like the final performance of our model to a new test data set that was unseen before by our model so that can make the accuracy estimation a bit more uh, but there are also other ways to verify that the machine learning model actually worked in our field 
So as I mentioned before, we can do the uh, training and data set split to estimate the prediction on the new unseen data. Then if we have some prior knowledge, which is well studied, then we can use that knowledge and experimental data to compare what we learn, what we what are the what are the hypotheses that we can generate with our new machine learning approach to what is already well known in our field. But if we don't have such uh, well studied uh, information, then we can also try to simulate uh, the synthetic data where we can where we can implant all the knowledge of the field that we actually have and then we can see what the machine learning model can generate from that data and what was in this synthetic data set what was the knowledge in that synthetic data set so what can be a prior knowledge in our air case for example, it can be the VDJ recombination process. So we know that the receptors they are generating during the VDJ recombination. And if we can somehow also include the binding specificity into this uh, model and then generate a data set that takes into account all of this, then we can not only to estimate several the accuracies of several machine learning approaches on one experimental data. But we can also see if the model actually learned what we uh, what we encoded in the data as the binding, as a VDJ model, etc. So we aim to achieve both high accuracy and is the ground truth was actually learned. There are two the most known tools that can simulate VDJ model. One of them is Iger and Olga. The other one is ImmuneSim, so they both can do accurate VDJ recombination simulation. And uh, Olga and Iger can also estimate the generation probability of every receptor with respect to the model. But ImmuneSim, for example, can also implant a gapped camer into receptor, so which can also correspond to the specificity of this receptor. Uh, we can use VDJ recombination and this implantation idea to profile air, uh, air machine learning methods, for example, logistic regression on a range of basic data sets. So we can implant those short KMERs uh, with different frequency. And then we can see if those motifs were actually detected by our method. And with this study, we shown what are the parameter boundaries for different KMERs. But in real life, we think that immune signal can be much more complex. And from the previous studies, we know that uh, an immune signal can be a gapped KMER, or in more general way, it can be a motif, or so a distribution over nucleotides or amino acids. From Emerson study, we know that those uh, specific receptors can, can be even the full length receptors and in the most general way uh, these immune signal this hidden information can be any function that takes a receptor and then returns true or false whether the receptor contains immune signal or not so here we uh, here we formalize the immune signal definition for the air data. So we start with the motifs. A motif is a distribution over nucleotides or amino acids, but then for the immune signal, it's a motif plus some immune specific information such as V gene or J gene or IMGT position of this specific motif. And then we can combine this immune signals, set of immune signals with the disease label later. Of course, if we want to make a simulator that uh, can do all these uh, um, signal simulations, uh, we should take into account many different aspects. So ideally, our synthetic data should have similar biological properties as experimental data. For example, it should the synthetic data should have similar distributions of some biological statistics such as generation probabilities or VDJ distribution, gene distribution. Also, we don't want to break the biological properties of our data. For example, we know that the 
immune receptors have conserved area in the beginning and in the end of the CDR3 region, and we don't want to break that. Um, also, we want to stimulate immune signal of any complexity, and our ideal simulator should do that. And one more thing that complicates the simulation is that the these different immune signals can be receptor can contain several immune signals, and also those signals can be overlapping within one repertoire. So it's not very easy to make a perfect simulator that will take into account all these things. But currently we are working on such a simulator. It will do this signal uh, implantation on the receptor and on the repertoire level. But also if you want to work with some structure, you can use absolute. Uh, it's You can generate uh, synthetic three-dimensional antibody antigen structures using absolute. Then you can introduce all the possible uh, signals that you want to, your machine learning model to detect later. And then that will be your ground truth for the machine learning method that it should detect. And then you should check for the high accuracy, both for the high accuracy and what was actually learned by the model. I think that uh, this synthetic data approach can be a really nice sanity check for our model, because if our model cannot detect what we think it should detect in an experimental data and something that probably it will not also work with the experimental data. So ideally, we think that uh, AR machine learning approaches should be developed in parallel on the experimental and on the synthetic data. So, Milena? Okay, so... <laughs> Sorry about the technical uh, difficulties. They were not there uh, half an hour ago. Um, so uh, we talk about this uh, simulation stuff and uh, talk a lot about uh, how we can compare different machine learning methods. Uh, but in order to do any of those things, we first need to be able to kind of reproduce the existing studies. And th there are many, many different uh, studies and they differ in the languages they were implemented in. They differ in whether the code is available or not. And uh, is it just the description of the algorithm or is it actually the open source code? Um, and uh, so we have th this different amount of, uh, of information for, for these studies. And we want to make sure that um, not only that they work as uh, as described, but how they perform on our own data sets or new data sets. So uh, last year there was uh, this uh, DOME paper uh, that included a set of recommendations for uh, reproducible supervised uh, machine learning uh, in uh, biology that looked into different uh, types of information that need that are kind of suggested to be provided by different method uh, developers so that the, these uh, methods can be uh, uh, both uh, reproducible and uh, properly uh, reported. And this includes the recommendation uh, related to uh, how we uh, provide the information in the data sets uh, that were used, what was used for training, what was used for testing. Uh, then it includes how we do uh, evaluation, how we do optimization in order to avoid uh, fitting our method too much on, on the current data set that will not then generalize to new data. It uh, requires uh, of us to include the description and the choice of the model, uh, possibly release the, the source code and the other information, and then to be very specific about how we do uh, evaluation of uh, of different methods. And uh, for example, the cross-validation is one of the good practices in, in that regard. Uh, we also looked a bit uh, into this uh, from uh, our side in our group. And uh, one um, thing that uh, we developed is uh, this platform 
uh, called Immunomel for uh, development and uh, transparent evaluation of different uh, AI machine learning methods. Um, Immunomel is uh, open source. It's uh, publicly available. It's available on GitHub. It's available as a Python package. Um, and uh, what it does is uh, it formalizes uh, some uh, machine learning uh, workflows that are relevant in the uh, air setting. Uh, so it can it provides uh, the workflow to train a machine learning model um, that is based on the uh, air data set and the detailed specification files to describe everything that has been done in a great level of detail. Uh, we can do a bit of a simulation, but uh, that uh, uh, that is just a, a, a subset of that. Uh, then uh, we can apply the trained models, uh, and uh, as output from the analysis using Immunomel, uh, users uh, get uh, HTML reports, trained methods, or uh, synthetic uh, data sets uh, that were provided. So this is one uh, attempt at uh, kind of helping uh, the, the community uh, by developing this infrastructure around their methodology development. And uh, I hope uh, it can it can be useful. So uh, with this, we kind of uh, want to be able to ensure that uh, to implement the procedures that allow us to estimate how well our methods perform on the new uh, data sets uh that or on the data sets that we have in a properly in the proper manner the correct manner to test it to over to account for overfitting underfitting and similar uh issues that uh, can happen in machine learning but the question is if uh, we actually instead of that if we actually develop a new method and we are happy with it uh what is kind of the next step so in terms of uh, developing a diagnostics what we would uh, want typically is to uh, we start with uh, some sort of uh, source population uh, that has uh, uh, healthy individuals and diseased individuals, um, and they have uh, some some properties, some sort of uh, distribution over their characteristics, like uh, age distribution, uh, how many are diseased versus how many are healthy, and so on. And then from that population, what we typically do is we select a set of participants uh, for our study, and this is our study cohort. Um, then we say, okay, now we do sample collection, we do uh, sequencing, and we obtain uh, a certain set of uh, repertoires. Uh, that is, again, uh, partially, uh, partially reflecting what is happening in the... Uh, in the individual's body uh, and I say, okay, then uh, using this information, we want to be able to build uh, a machine learning model and we can estimate this performance and we are quite happy with what uh, we did. So now if that works, what we typically want to do afterwards is actually use that on a new uh, kind of some sort of new population on a, uh, it could be in the, now we want to apply it in the clinic, or it could be just we want to use it for a different uh, data set coming from a different group. And uh, what is problematic with this is that uh, if we look into the different, uh, as called here, variables of interest, but it could be age, HLA, uh, or other information, they will typically differ between populations. And, uh, or it could uh, just uh, change. Uh, between different populations. So how, uh, what do we do with machine learning in this case? Because machine learning is defined to, as we discussed it before, it was defined to work on uh, the data that is independent from each other and that has the same distribution on the, in the, uh, for the data set that we trained the model on and where we want to apply it. And that's not something that necessarily happens uh, when we, come to the application settings. So there is something called uh, the causal inference framework. And uh, the causal inference framework is uh, more concerned with uh, formally describing the data generating process, uh, like our biological mechanism, in order to discover uh, some sort of causal effects uh, between different uh, variables in this process. So uh, 
is that if we have one variable, we want to estimate how it causally affects another. So this is just how this other variable changes, uh, how the changes in the first variable affect the other one, provided that everything else is the same. And uh, we talked about how machine learning estimates statistical associations, not causality. And causality is such doesn't matter too much for prediction tasks, uh, but uh, it's still when we look into uh, new data that we obtain or uh, when we apply to new populations, if we look into causality, it can help us uh, formalize and de describe these uh, changes and maybe solve some challenges even in predictive setting. And uh, if we look into uh, uh, an example of a causal model describing like what is that's happening in biology for a viral infection, um, we can uh, draw like different uh, variables that represent the different uh, concepts uh, of, of interest, like age, uh, genetics, uh, HLA, the, the repertoire. Um, we can uh, see that uh, there are different relations between these uh, variables. So what uh, can happen is uh, there can uh, exist some sort of a selection bias in our data, which can happen anytime uh, that we have some sort of uh, preferential selection of study participants. It can introduce spurious correlations in our data, which is something that we don't want to happen. Then uh, we can have uh, confounding bias. So those are the variables that influence both the, the repertoire and the immune state, for example, that we want to, to predict. Um, or we can have different batch effects, timings of measurements that influence there. And causality kind of defines a bit how we can, uh, what do we need to control for it? We want uh, this to be stable uh, or not. So uh, this is just a something uh, thinking in line, how can we guard against uh, the changes in the in the data, different uh, data sets. Uh, so with that, I think we could uh, wrap it up. Uh, and uh, so just uh, some uh, points that uh, I hope uh, came across clear from, uh, from our talk um, is that uh, there are many uh, many machine learning methods uh, that are applied to air data, but it's uh, more complex than just uh, choosing an off the shelf uh, machine learning and uh, putting it on on the uh, air data because uh, air data has uh, complex biological structures, um, both in terms and in terms of uh, repertoires. Um, there is a large uh, uh, the the repertoires, uh, the receptors are both uh, very diverse, and uh, we only observe a small portion of the potential uh, receptor space. And there are other variables that also influence what is uh, happening in this case um, that could complicate our uh, machine learning methods. So uh, one thing that we uh, hope to uh, show was that it is necessary to uh, benchmark uh, these uh, developed methodologies on uh, both synthetic data and on experimental data so that we can do a bit of sanity checks uh, on the in the synthetic uh, data case and then see how it actually performs on the experimental settings and uh, in order to be able to uh, develop methods that will actually uh, work in uh, and be possible to apply in clinical settings, for example, we need large scale experimental data and we need to know the ground truth so that we can validate our, um, our algorithms. And with that, uh, uh, we would like to thank the, uh, all the people from uh, our lab that uh, kind of uh, work a lot uh, on this topic. And uh, yeah, thank you for having us here and uh, giving us the opportunity to, to present uh, uh, today, um, I think we could uh, try to I will switch off the mic. Yeah. All right, well, I'm back anyway, and I hope our speakers uh, will soon be ready. Are you ready to answer? Questions?
Looks like you're both muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we have one of you. Well, maybe two of you because we're getting echo. But <laughs> a bit of uh, setup issues. Well, you, you're you're winging it very well. Yes. We can hardly Should we tell there's to... a technical issue. <laughs> All right, are, are you ready? To... Question? Yeah, are you ready to answer questions? I will start with the first one. Okay. Do you think there is enough information encoded in the receptors? Uh, yes. Should we start from the first question? Uh, can you hear me? Do you, do you think there is enough information encoded in the receptor sequence alone for ML to be able to predict antigen specificity? Or will this always require some structural information? I mean, that's a good question. Um, and I think it, uh, uh, the fact that we can predict structure uh, from the sequence information might mean that uh, this could be uh, something that uh, can be used also for uh, antigen specificity prediction. Um, but mm, so what the, some of the uh, groups are doing is to actually develop a, a structure prediction method and then use the predicted structure to predict the antigen specificity. Uh, which could be uh, one way to to go around it. Um, I hope that answers the. Should we also cite ABDB there? <laughs> so yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I'll go ahead and ask the question. Are these immune you can think available about it. in air? And do you mean the data that is available or the methods that are available? So I think there are quite many public uh, data sets uh, that you can use. And also some of the simulation tools are already available. So for example, Iger, Olga, um, ImmuneSim, they are already published. Uh, Absolute, you can find it as a print print, but it will be soon uh, available as a publication. Um, the simulation approach that I was talking during the presentation, we hope that we will also have a preprint soon. So, um, if you can specify what you mean by immunoseq, maybe I will reply in more details. Yeah. Um, so, I think we can just uh, move on. Yeah. So, for the diagnostic scheme, uh, are public uh, immune receptors more useful than unique receptors? Um, uh, some approaches look into only uh, public uh, receptors, for example, the, uh, in the Emerson, uh, in the paper by Emerson and colleagues, they look to discover sequences that are uh, associated with uh, disease based on looking only into public sequences and then that appear, uh, that are enriched uh, across uh, repertoires. Uh, that is, that is definitely one possibility. However, a very small percentage of sequences are uh, public, and uh, but not uh, a small percentage of sequence are uh, necessarily, not all, of, not, all, not all of the antigen specific sequences need to be public. So there is probably some um, other information that could be used also from unique receptors that are shared across the unique receptors that share the antigen specificity. So from some um, analysis of structural information, it was shown that um, some of the sequences that the actual binding happens on a, a subsequence uh, level, and maybe it is enough for those to be shared um, across uh, receptors. Maybe it is a bit more information, but it's probably something more detailed than actual uh, full sequence, uh, full unique sequences. 
Can I add just a bit? So in my opinion, they both matter, the public and the unique one that are specific for disease, but maybe they just, they are matter in a slightly different way. So I think you, we should take into account both. So we cannot just say, let's zoom in into the public receptors. Those are the most important. I think all of them are important. Um, okay. Considering therapeutic applications, do we know the immunogenicity of them? Do we mean the specificity by immunogenicity? No. Well, um, there are quite many different data sets and databases. For example, there is this uh, VDJDP MCPAS uh, database for uh, where we have uh, the information about different uh, receptors and then the specificity to the antigen. And sometimes we also have the information, the sequence of the antigen. So uh, it is collected from many different papers, from many different studies in one uh, database. So we can use that. Um, but most of the time, I would say for the therapeutic application, we just have uh, the ARSeq data. So we have just a FASTA file with a bunch of receptors, with a bunch of strings, and we don't really know what is the specificity of each. Uh, in future, we hope that using the LibraSeq and other methods, we will know the specificity of every receptor, but for now, we only have the sequences. Um, okay, so uh, next question is to what extent are models that use structural information for the prediction of receptor specificity reliable? The structure is predicted and not experimentally proven, so its accuracy will always depend on the accuracy of AlphaFold or any algorithm that was used. So, yes, of course, that is a, a challenge in, in this uh, regard. Um, in terms of predicting the receptor specificity, that information might be experimentally validated. Um, that can be kind of one way we assure that our structure-based uh, uh, prediction of specificity kind of works. Um, is it a solved problem? Probably no. Uh, can we predict it uh, decently? Probably yes. Uh, but I think we need kind of more uh, better ways to explain what is happening there and to actually validate all these uh, predictions that uh, we have gotten uh, so far. So uh, I think this is definitely uh, going in that direction, but uh, probably uh, still some external validation would be needed. Since there are so many models and ways to approach sequence embedding, how to know which one to choose? <laughs> that was a really nice question. I mean, probably use some synthetic data because also different methods and different encodings, embeddings, they use different assumptions about your data. For example, if you use k encoding, if you just cut your sequence into k then probably those encoding will not be powerful enough to detect uh, some information that cannot be easily translated into those k So. Yeah, I think uh, there are many models, there are many ways. What is needed are like benchmarking efforts uh, in order to kind of consolidate this and uh, be able to say something more definitive. But for that, we also, as I said, need the ground truth data uh, that is uh, like to, to confirm that even if the model performs best, that it is actually uh, learning what is supposed to be learning. So this is an open and ongoing research question. Yeah, also, I think it will be really nice if uh, the AIR community will benchmark all the AIR machine learning algorithm on, on a unified set of uh, data sets with different properties and both experimental and synthetic, but uh, this is not done yet. Uh, yes, yeah, and this is the, the follow-up question. So the way to check which model is the right one is to run as many embeddings as possible. Um, maybe not as many as possible, but I 
think it is kind of necessary to do an extensive benchmarking because most of the methods compare against very few other methods. And uh, another component that we have to look at is what we believe about the domain to be true. Um, because off the shelf stuff doesn't necessarily work well. So what we want is to see what uh, methodology uh, that we have best reflects our domain knowledge and then compare those uh, into uh, like on, on actual either experimental or synthetic data sets. Um, okay, so there was uh, a comment uh, that a newer version of ABDB uh, data is uh, coming up uh, soon. Uh, that is uh, very good to know. Um, and uh, so one more question is, how did you approach the design of ImmunML so that the majority of L AIR algorithms can be used? Um, so what we try to do is to define um, what needs to get, uh, what is the input and what is the output of uh, different methods while leaving the actual method implementation completely up to the method developer. Uh, so what we provide is, uh, if someone, we try to also implement some methods inside ImmunML that were published before ImmunML was there. Um, but we also hope that the community would uh, use ImmunML. Um, so it, also for development of uh, methods. And uh, the workflow of someone using it for development would be that uh, it is just necessary to implement your own method uh, the same way you would elsewhere. But ImmunML would take care of representing the data. Um, it would take care of importing the data in the appropriate AIR format and uh, things like that, uh, doing this uh, cross-validation stuff, reporting the details uh, and all those things. So. Um, on the website, we also have uh, developer documentation where we describe this in uh, great detail and are very open to community feedback and uh, discussions. I think okay. that's all. Yeah, those are all the, the comments. Um, there is uh, one more. Um, wouldn't benchmarking fall into the same issue as applying models in different populations? Different subsets of sequences from different samples may yield different results for benchmarking. Um, well, it, it, or do you want to answer that? Or? Yeah, maybe you can start and I will add a few words from my side. Yes, so I think uh, it, it depends how you define the, the benchmarking. Uh, so what you could do is not compare the exact uh, train models, but instead compare the algorithms, train them all on the same data and compare them all on the same uh, test data. Um, you can do that on uh, one data set, on multiple different data sets across uh, certain, like uh, increasing, for example, level of complexity or uh, differing the, with the different uh, assumptions of how the data, uh, the signal in the data actually looks like. Um, and it could also be how well, so this is like, uh, something we call internal validity, right? Like how well your method performs on the data that looks the same. And then on top of that, you can also look into what happens when you change the distribution of your data and when does the method stop working, that it does always work. What are those kind of scenarios? So you can define the benchmarking in both of those. Yeah. So no one ultimate algorithm that will work perfectly well on different types of data. Probably one method will work when we have some confounders. The other method will work better if the immune signal or something is defined as a chimera. The other method will work better if it's defined as uh, the full length receptor, etc. So. Yeah, it's like saying that there is one statistical test that will, you know, work perfectly well with all the possible alternative hypotheses. It never, it's never like that. So I think it's something similar to that problem. Um, 
Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, interesting for questions. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I, 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 I so think we've been stop because <laughs> I don't. They can't hear me. We can hear you probably. Yeah, they, okay, they can't hear me because they don't have. Okay, the probably we need to stop. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I think you need to stop. <laughs> but I do thank our speakers uh, for providing their insights on machine learning for the analysis of adaptive immune receptors and repertoires. And I thank you also for joining the webinar today. An on-demand version will be available in a few days. I will send a link via email to everyone who registered, so you will be able to find this uh, in, a, in a day or so. Please feel free to watch this or any of our on-demand webinars when it's convenient. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.